we'll get things started. Our first speaker is Jeff Orlovsky. He is a director, producer, and cinematographer of a number of award-winning films, including accolades such as um, awards at Stundance, shortlisting for an Academy Award uh, for Best Documentary, as you can kind of peep in his uh, Zoom background, at least one Emmy that I can see. Um, Jeff has founded uh, Exposure uh, Labs, which is a production company dedicated to impact through film. And he'll be talking to us today about his latest film, The Social Dilemma, uh, which had its world premiere in 2020 at Sundance and is now available on Netflix. Our second guest is Renee DiResta. She is a technical research manager at Stanford Observatory. Um, she investigates the spread of malign narratives across social and other media networks. Uh, her area of expertise includes, research expertise includes disinformation and propaganda. Brady has advised Congress, the U.S. State Department, and other academic and civic organizations. And she's also the co-author of The Hardware Startup, uh, Building Your Product, Business, and Brand by O'Reilly. So with that, um, please welcome Jeff and Renee. And uh, Jeff, would you like to um, uh, get us started? I thought I would give a warm-up question for you and Renee to both chime in on in terms of, um, uh, for our audience, uh, many of whom probably have seen The Social Dilemma, some of whom may not have seen it yet. Could you say a little bit about the documentary uh, in terms of what you think some of the main messages are and your sense of maybe some of the key documentary uh, takeaways from the documentary? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, great to see you here, Renee. Thanks, Tyler and Julie and, and everyone hosting. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just go to your point there, Tyler, about a quick overview of The Social Dilemma, but I'll, I'll describe that from kind of how we got into making the film in that um, I very much, uh, I'm pro-technology and love technology and went to Stanford University and all of my friends ended up working in tech. Um, and that was a path I was pursuing and was going down for quite a while until life took me into filmmaking. And it was a few years ago where some of my friends from Google and Twitter and Facebook were starting to voice these conflicts and these tensions about what these companies were making and distributing to the world in a way that I'd never heard before. I mean, I had rose colored glasses around what the optimistic story was out of social media's positive impact on society. And to hear problems around manipulative design and, um, and a business model that was at odds with society led me and our team down this path to want to explore and investigate what are the consequences that social media is having on society in what ways and in which areas of society um, and that really has just been the, the exploration for us over the past few years. And that's what we really tried to encapsulate and embody in the film, looking at the harmful consequences of this advertising business model. Great, Jeff, thanks. Um, I did bring my Stanford coffee mug with me uh, on celebration of the thing. Quick trivia tip for everyone else. Um, US coffee cups tend to be a little bigger than British ones. So these actually hold a little more liquid, which is why I keep those around. But anyways, uh, Renee, welcome. Um, would you like to chime in and say a little bit? Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here this afternoon for me, or I guess this morning, still technically in California. Um, I, uh, I think what I really loved about the film was the way it showed the individual impact. So there was a lot of this sort of theme of, um, uh, social alienation or, um, you know, the challenges of relating uh, on a on a personal level to people in the, um, you know, kind of the era in which we're all sort of more plugged into our devices and that sort of individual experience of, um, of alienation, of loneliness, you know, Jonathan Haidt's uh, portion where he talks about uh, the impact of uh, things like filters on, on teenage girls. Um, but then also the way in which, if you zoom out, um, you can see the impact on society. And so there's this, um, impact on an individual level and then an aggregate, how does, what does this turn us into uh, writ large? And that was where you started to see the content related to politics and to conspiracy theories and to uh, mis and disinformation and its impact on society. So again, the, um, the differences in scale, I thought was one of my favorite things that the film managed to incorporate both. Thanks, Renee. <laughs> That was one of the hardest things for us to, to tackle as well. And, and one last thought just before we jump in, Tyler, um, as you were referencing live tweeting earlier, um, uh, tweeting at me will do nothing because I will never check it and don't see it. And uh, I have stopped using all social media. So that's sort of just this uh, dead end over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to, to chip in, I mean, it's, it's fascinating already. And I love the sort of document, docudrama approach to try to fuse that sort of interview with, with, with the narrative. And it gave, for example, that terrifying element, as anybody who's watched 
the, the film will know of the avatar being controlled and, and particularly reactivated <laughs> maliciously. I mean, it's a terrifying image. Um, I, so I guess I have two questions that one is, um, why did you film that way? Do you find it would be more effective? But I guess the other question for either of you, perhaps for Renee, is could that be done in a benign way? Could we have a benign model of that where those three sort of people controlling the avatar were doing it for the avatar's benefit? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that question, Julian, to, to kick it off. Um, so for me, the reason why we did that is because as we were working on the film, as we were learning from all of the experts and engineers, when we were learning from the people who designed the algorithms, I was then getting for the first time a real understanding of what exactly these algorithms are doing and how they operate. And I started to pick up my phone and look at the notifications coming in and look at like, why am I seeing this particular post at this particular moment? And I started to see it and feel it in a completely different way than I had, you know, just a couple months prior. Um, so for me, it was a sort of like awakening to, um, and obviously we can talk about the pros and cons of anthropomorphizing algorithms, but separate from the anthropomorphization, the, the notion of um, showing the intention and the objectives and a goal state for an algorithm was really what we were trying to dive into. Um, there are algorithms that are optimizing for growth, network growth, for engagement, for advertisement placement, for frequency, for the specific content. These are all being driven by algorithms right now. And that was complete news to me. Um, as as a, a student of this going into it, I was then feeling these experiences when I picked up my phone. And that was one of the big questions and challenges is how do we relate that to the audience? You know, we can keep this very intellectual and heady with a bunch of talking heads, which I love and is very functional and works really well in film. But at the same time, how do we make it as engaging as possible? And how do the hope was like, if a viewer watches the movie and they go home and they look at their phone afterwards, maybe they think about why they're seeing things in a slightly different way. And to bring that to life through this metaphor, through this visual analogy, which from all of the subjects that we, we spoke with and, and the, the people who built and designed and understood the algorithms, that notion of that avatar is the representation of a digital model that exists for each and every one of us with all of these platforms, right? Google has a little model of you, Facebook has a model of you, Twitter has a model of you, and they're all constantly testing on those models what's going to be most effective on us. Um, so for, for me, it was, um, the really the, the tool that we can leverage through film and cinema as a medium to bring this metaphor and this analogy to life to let audiences understand exactly what's going on. And Renee, I'd be interested in your take. Yeah, could that could that could they be beneficial or, or add anything to the um, you know, I think it's a very interesting question. I think yes, I think that when you have a system of uh, where everyone is there and there are ways to reach people. It is, you know, we, we can envision ways in which this is used for positive things. I can think of um, even things that have already existed, right? Marking yourself safe during an earthquake or, um, or, an, or, or you know, some other natural disaster. Um, ways in which um, I think I've seen um, blood donation drives after a, after a few um, disasters in, in, uh, in parts of the world or, um, I think uh, vaccination information right now is a, is a really key area where, again, everybody's on the platforms talking about things. So not only driving people to good information, but what we're starting to see is like informal organization into groups um, where as people are becoming eligible to be vaccinated, there are these little groups that are emerging locally where people are not sharing vaccine misinformation at all. Instead, they're saying like, you know, Walgreens has doses. This, you know, Oakland Coliseum has doses. You can tell I'm, I'm uh, out west over here. But, um, and I'm seeing it a lot locally as, you know, as, as our rollout is happening in California where people are using these tools, these tools for connecting. Um, there's, I think, two things that social platforms are really used for. And this is not, um, sorry, my cat is <laughs> making an appearance here. Um, there is the ways in which it helps people connect so the formation of positive social groups and while there are many negative groups there are also um, extraordinary number of positive groups um, survivor communities communities for various cancers and a lot of a um, lot of ways in which this has really brought people together independent of geography and i think that's a very powerful thing and then there's the way information moves so there's the social structures and the information structures and Sometimes the intersection is bad, but there are ways to potentially rethink curation to uh, amplify better information, help surface better information uh, to bring people together or to provide them with accurate, um, timely 
content related to things that is, you know, sort of materially impacting their lives at a moment in time. And that's where I think the, the real potential is. I do still have a Facebook account, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm on Twitter all the time. And, and, I, and I do see a lot of value in these platforms uh, for me, while at the same time recognizing the bad aspects and, and the ways in which um, the neglect and the um, kind of amorality in, in some of the ways curation and recommendations have been handled over the last five years um, have led to a lot of the problems that we're experiencing today. I'd love to just add another thought there, if I may, because I missed the second part of your question, Julian, in, in that earlier answer. Um, and I, I'm with you, Renee, on uh, separate from the positive aspects that can come from social platforms, what I wanted to talk to is the positive aspects that can come from a digital model of us and a digital representation of us and where AI and machine learning can be really, really positive for society. Um, uh, as, as an example, like I, I want my doctor to have my a record of my DNA and have AI that can better predict what health implications might happen in my life. Like that is a, in my mind, a really, really positive opportunity for how AI and machine learning can be constructed um, in, in ways that help society. I think one of the challenges that I wrestle with is when are these tools, these incredibly powerful tools being used for us versus against us? Um, this is where I, I bring it back to the business model that in, in the case of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, Instagram, Snapchat, like the, the model that's being built of us in those instances um, is being used to create engaging content for us that, that feeds their business model as opposed to what's going to best fulfill me in my life as, as just like a total counterpoint, right? Um, so I think that's one of the things that... Um, I think the opportunity for big data to be used positively for society really does exist. Um, the line that we use in the film, and I fully acknowledge and call out, it's an oversimplification, but it works well for the general public. Um, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, right? That, that oversimplification helps align in some ways getting a sense of who the customer is. Like who, who are the services being built for and designed for at the fundamental level? Um, and so that's one of the things that I see, like how, how do we continue to build towards that? Um, how do we make social media that I am paying for that is creating content, whether it's content for me or a social connection, or um, uh, how do I deepen the relationship with my friends and family through social platforms? Like I would, I'd love to spend 20 bucks a month on something that's gonna make me feel closer to my friends and family. Right, that I'm just voicing that as a hypothetical of a path we could be going down instead. I think it's interesting you bring that up because um, um, in uh, Jaron Lanier, who uh, was on the um, Social Dilemma, uh, his book, The um, uh, uh, 10 Reasons to Delete Your Social Media Right Now, he talks about that in particular, especially right this kind of hypothetical situation where there was at some point in the history of kind of like internet land where we could have gone that way you're talking about exactly in terms of like we could have gone the paid subscription model as opposed to free where we're paying with our data as opposed to this so it is interesting there's a film idea actually to be like oh what would that look like what, what would internet and social media look like if it were the the, the paid subscription approach and and that is something that we explored pretty heavily in in the making of the film we were looking through you know what is the original sin of this problem i think jaron um, very much likes to lean into this mindset. We, we wanted to make it free, but we also wanted to get rich off of it. And how would it, how, balancing those two tensions out led to this advertising model as one of the only ways at the start to let it grow quickly and be free and also yield a lot of money at the same time. Um, and what Jaron says as, a, as an example, when he, he talks to subscription models as being a much better opportunity. Um, so the alignment and in incentives, if you talk about a Netflix or HBO or Hulu and the content that's coming through those platforms, certainly we have another attention and time extraction conversation there. But one of the things that we don't see coming out of those platforms is misinformation and conspiracy theory going viral. Right, this is not, open, there's human curation in the process. And we see that those systems that are um, subscription based tend to have seemingly a better alignment with the general public than do the YouTubes and Facebooks and Twitters in terms of what we see out of misinformation and conspiracy theory. Can I be a bit provocative on this? And, and you know, again, Renee, I don't want to cut you off and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because while there's a lot that I agree with there completely and, and you know, quite attractive to have a subscription model in, instead so you know how it's being funded. 
we say that from a perspective where we can afford to pay for that. Um, you know, I've, I've just read a book by Sam Gilbert, Good Data, which is, I think, coming out very shortly. I think you pre-order it now, um, which goes into quite some detail about some of these things. So Apple, for example, are very good on privacy. Um, they're also incredibly expensive. Um, how do we, you know, there is something very nice about the fact that Facebook, for example, provides a free service in areas and to people who wouldn't necessarily be able to pay. Um, is there a risk that we end up saying that we'd really like a system that is fantastic for, you know, wealthier people? Um, the notion of making it free versus paid, I think, is completely separate than what that pay scale might look like in different countries. Um, so to say that it would only be affordable to the rich, I think, is a, a fallacy in that that could be a sliding scale that works in different ways. Um, Facebook makes more money in the United States and Canada than they do in, you know, select a, you know, other countries, like the, the money is coming in large part through the Western developed world that is pushing advertising through it. Um, and, and that's where there's a real asymmetry in how much money is coming in. Um, I think Facebook likes to say that they need to make the service free so that it's accessible everywhere. However, um, I think genuinely the reason why it's free is because that's how they make the most money. What they have discovered from internal research that I've heard of is that um, the, in their internal analysis, people would not be willing to pay as much money as they can yield through the advertising model. And that's really the reason why um, that they've, they've gone down this path. If they could have made more money through a subscription, I think they would have embraced that earlier. Renee, did you want to come in on any of this? Sorry. Tyler. Yeah, another question, just to follow up and thinking about all the things that you've said so far. Um, I'm curious, and you've, Jeff, you mentioned a couple of things like kind of the Twitter embargo and these things, but I'm curious in your personal or professional lives, what has been different or what have you noticed over the past year or two from um, uh, since the documentaries come out? And um, at least from, I'll, I'll chime in just a little bit with my personal background. So I worked, I did, I was in big tech. I worked at Google about a decade ago. Um, we... I, at least, and the people I worked with weren't really thinking about these issues. Like, we're just focused on doing a good job and delivering a good product. Um, uh, now I care very deeply about it. You know, I research this at Cambridge. Um, but I wonder, like, has this been a little bit of a, a catalyst or kind of like a galvanizing thing in terms of just like other other parts of the industry that, you know, like, is, have they facilitated any conversations that are noteworthy to you? Um, I would I would certainly hope so. And um, I mean, there are so many uh, anecdotal stories I can share and offer. Um, I'll try and keep these brief, but um, we've seen so much engagement uh, around this issue since the launch of the film. Um, it's been extremely heavily viewed on Netflix and we're seeing it pop up in, in countless conversations all across the board. In the United States um, here, we've seen it come up on both sides of the political aisle with both Lindsey Graham and Nancy Pelosi referencing the film publicly and telling people to watch the film. Um, we've seen incredible engagement with policymakers from around the world with the desire to better understand these systems and to think about their role in regulation and what meaningful regulation looks like. Um, I think uh, another big notable turning point was January 6th here in the US where I think the conversation pre and post January 6th around technology's role in influencing society and shaping society has massively transformed. Um, there is a line in the film from one of our subjects, uh, Tim Kendall, for, uh, director of monetization at Facebook, um, president of Pinterest, um, and he says that uh, in the film that we we interviewed him in 2019 around this, and we asked him what, is, what was his worst case scenario, like what's his worst fear around where this technology goes, and he answered civil war. And at the time when we did that, I think our whole crew was like, what, really? And then when we were editing it and reviewing and debating, do we include this line? And then um, when we were screening it, and even when, when we had feedback from distributors around, like that's kind of an intense line, should we lean into that or not? And then January 6th comes and then everybody's like, oh, I get it now. And we get what this technology has the power to do and how it can um, uh, uh, perpetrate and exacerbate, algorithmically amplify misinformation at scale that can lead to um, divisions like this. Um, so these are just a, a handful of the examples that have come up since the release of the film. One other thing to, to quote Tim Kendall on, and, and I think this is a reflection of the, the shifts that we've been seeing within the industry. Um, 
Tim's mindset is that uh, for whether it's Facebook or many of these companies and many of these startups, they've always come into the world in this very, very much a David versus Goliath scenario where, hey, we're struggling. We're a tiny startup. We're working in a garage or a basement. We're just trying to get out there. We need to grow. We need to figure out how to survive. And at some point, they go from the underdog, they go from David to Goliath. And the values and the technology and the approach and the thinking that allows a David to grow and become a notable entity in our world now aren't necessarily the same values and the mindsets that we want to need when something is operating at societal scale and puppeteering our entire information ecosystem. And so there's this transformation that happens with these tech companies that we need to be thinking in new ways around how do you build ethics into the origins of these companies and these organizations so that if and when they do hopefully grow to meaningful scale, that they are net positive for society in how they are um, influencing and affecting the global conversation. Uh, these are really tough questions, right? These are really, really challenging things for us to understand and for us to tackle. But there's, there's something in that transition where we need to be thinking about ethics at scale in a completely different way than we have been. I think that's really interesting. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I, uh, I have a question for Renee um, in, in your work for uh, kind of like at the nexus of academic and policy things, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. Um, Renee, I'm curious um, in terms of what do you think we could do? Um, you know, like we're obviously we're hold, hosting this event at the University of Cambridge. We do a lot of research in these things. Um, how do we foster and facilitate more conversations that will actually lead to further meaningful action? Like, do you have yeah, thoughts on that? That's a great question. So I'm relatively new to academia. Um, I don't have a PhD. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, you know, for me, one of the reasons to go into academia was actually to, um, because I believed that what Stanford Internet Observatory's vision was, which was a very interdisciplinary program in which um, some people come from academia, some from tech, we have a lot of students who are involved. Um, but ultimately, the focus was less on the traditional model of producing academic papers where we were going to research something deeply for two years, have a, you know, kind of long-term data corpus, and then write a paper that was going to come out, you know, a year and a half after that. Um, for me, that, that time horizon felt too slow. And so SIO was created with the idea that there was a, a, a need for sort of a third, um, a third way, not necessarily industry investigating or, or companies investigating industry, so that, that model, not traditional academic research where there's definitely a very significant need for that, but something in the middle that, that would allow us to do what we call rapid response. So when there are um, interesting emergent either manipulation campaigns or certain facets of um, people's experience on the internet where a feature or a policy change made by a tech platform directly shapes the behavior and the experience of people who engage on the platform. Uh, understanding that dynamic, that sort of shorter term feedback loop from the outside, as opposed to people within the companies who have, are, of course, studying this very, very closely with um, far more robust data than we have on the outside, but at least to create a, a center where that kind of work could be done, specifically also with the goal of making recommendations derived from our observation and research related to uh, what, what a potential better uh, structure, affordance, policy, what have you might be. And so as an example, um, you know, we started paying close attention to misinformation uh, related to the coronavirus very, very early last year, starting around January, February timeframe, largely when it was still in China, actually. And we were very interested in understanding the dynamics of the intersection between state media and social media. So a lot of times people think of media and social media as being separate. Uh, we don't, we see this as part of a spectrum. We see social as a channel um, with particular affordances that enable direct participation by ordinary people. So people decide what goes viral, people share content. Um, but ultimately, state media was using social media as the distribution channel to put out its opinions about 
COVID. And so what we started to see was Chinese state media, which has very, very large uh, follower bases on Facebook, despite the fact that Facebook is not available to people within China, Chinese state media uses it as an outward facing mouthpiece to communicate its, its, uh, its positions. And so uh, these pages have, in some cases, 100 million followers. They're very, very large. Um, to give a, to put that in perspective, CNN is about 35 million or so. Um, and what they began to do was put out uh, content related to COVID and sometimes mis misleading content related to COVID or very politically aligned content related to COVID. And they were using Facebook's ad tools to boost this content to the audiences they cared about. And now that Facebook has some visibility into ad targeting, we could see that this was going out to Southeast Asia, a lot of focus on Indonesia, some focus on Africa, not really so much the US, even though it was English language content, but this was a way in which a state actor was using a social platform to put state media content out and to boost it to audiences. And this is where it gets interesting. So those audiences have never indicated an interest in receiving a Chinese state media communication. Um, so this is just sort of like a push, right, which is an interesting dynamic. And also at the time, the content wasn't labeled as being state media. So anyone who receives this pushed, boosted post doesn't necessarily know where it's coming from. So this is an example of where as SIO researchers were observing that dynamic, we were able to understand what was the targeting modality, what kind of engagement and uptake were these narratives getting? How did these narratives compare to non-state media coverage by other publications as far as gauging the, um, you know, the sort of angle uh, that, that they were taking, the, the um, the kind of um, sentiment, if you will, of the content. Uh, but also more than that, one of the things that we were able to do was after doing the study for a few months was make a recommendation that the platforms might wanna label state media and that, that this was not something that should necessarily come down. You know, We do believe that information should remain up. Uh, we do believe that people should have the option to go and engage with Chinese state media on a social platform, but that in the interest, since this was being pushed and boosted, that there should be some sort of policy related to whether Facebook was going to accept advertising for state media. And if so, was there a way to make it very, very clear who the actor in this in this content, you know, who was putting out this content and why. And so that that's the kind of thing where it's not necessarily a traditional academic model, but for us, we see it as a way to say, um, here is a thing that is happening, here's a dynamic that is shaping conversation, here's a way that people's opinions about a very, very significant topic, a global pandemic, are being formed. Uh, and here is a potential um, design fix that doesn't actually even require regulation. It can be done relatively quickly. And here is a way for us to improve the information environment um, with this suggestion. So that's that's one example. You know, we we are we're at uh, um, io.stanford.edu. But what we're what we try to do is is create this opportunity for academics, uh, academic research, to then potentially. Uh, offer uh, policy solutions either to the platforms or to lawmakers related to um, features and affordances and dynamics that could potentially be improved. I think that's a powerful thing. Oh, sorry, Julian. I was just going to say, um, yeah, the, the the scope of what uh, the social dilemma has done in the work, you know, like uh, I really like Renee, we talked about the there is a third way rather than just you know, there's different ways to disseminate this information. Um, what the social dilemma has done is remarkable. I mean, don't quote me on this, but the, the average academic um, article or publication gets around 10 views, I think is what I heard last time. I'm, I could be wrong, but I'm not off by exponentially. So 10 views versus, you know, the, um, you know, the, the entire audience at Netflix is a very powerful thing. Um, speaking of audiences, we have a number of questions coming in. Julian, did you yeah. want to... Um, yeah, so we, we've had lots of questions and, and I'll try to get through them in some sort of groups uh, for, for both of you. And, and just since we're talking about COVID, maybe to start with that, so we've had a couple of questions in. Uh, so uh, Amelia Chapman points out that social media has been a lifeline for a lot of people during, during COVID-19. And the film, of course, predates the pandemic. Has that changed the message? How has the positive role of social media masked its ongoing dangers to society or a, has it have they just made the, the problems even worse and just related to that tina burton asked if there's any evidence about whether social media engagement has increased in the last year or not do either of you have any thoughts about how covid has changed this do you have to i can jump in renee or sorry i didn't know if you were uh, tagging me specifically um 
yeah, there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more engagement. We're all stuck in our houses and <laughs> um, looking for information. So there's a lot of people, you know, I think the platforms weren't designed originally to be um, information hubs for finding information about, uh, you know, how to stay healthy in a pandemic, but they became that in a sense. And and so they've, they've tried to, you know, struggled at times, but tried to think through what their responsibilities should be and really evolved their policies quite a bit related to uh, health misinformation as COVID has gone on. And now as the vaccine rollouts are happening in a number of different countries uh, related to the kind of content that's coming out about the vaccines. Beyond that, I think they do, you know, as I, as I was trying to allude to earlier, um, people are forming groups because they are you know, stuck inside and looking for ways to connect. And so it's not just Facebook. We've seen the rise of Clubhouse during this time, you know, a new kind of audio uh, social network um, where people still, you know, requires an invitation, but more and more people are getting on every day and they're rolling out more and more invitations um, where people get into rooms and just chat with each other. And it's just voice chat. Um, and they kind of align around a particular topic or they go because a particular prominent person is in the room and they want to sit and listen. So there's listening opportunities, speaking opportunities, uh, but it's it's bringing people together um, in a the same way we would perhaps have gone to hear a fireside chat or a lecture, you know, in some ways that's moving online, people are spending more time. Um, and I, I think that it, it has been really a net positive um, during this time, a way for people to feel a sense of support. I see a lot of people in, in my own community as we struggle to figure out when our schools are going to reopen, you know, <laughs> parent, they're, the parent groups are active, you know, <laughs> so there has been a lot of this, um, this uh, ways in which people are really trying to come together since we can't in the physical world. And, and I think it's been um, very, very valuable for that. I can add some additional thoughts there. Um, uh, I think this is where Renee and I have slightly different thoughts on, on this to some degree, but um, uh, I, I think for the dissemination of um, good information around COVID, obviously they've been a platform that has gone gotten good information and bad information out into the world. Um, but I think the thing that concerns me the most and worries me the most is uh, referencing some of Jonathan Haidt's work and the mental health impacts and, and implications. Obviously, like we're physically isolated, but now we spend more and more of our time in these virtual worlds that are, there's so much self-comparison that happens through this process. Um, and the, the notion of like where we are as a society and the mental health of our society as a whole, I am concerned that, um, that part of the anxiety and depression that we see happening is also being exacerbated through these very platforms in some ways. Um, that's just purely speculative, not based on any particular research, but having removed myself from these platforms for the last couple of years and uh, going through this experience where I'm connecting with friends and family through FaceTime or through Signal or engaging, still being able to, like, how do you get the benefits without the consequences? How do you engage via technology, whether we're talking about Zoom or FaceTime or, or a phone call and still get human to human connection without it being manipulated by a third party? Um, that's where I would, I would uh, encourage people to be thinking through, like, what are you actually getting from the different platforms um, and how it's either benefiting you professionally, personally, or your mental health? Can I move us on to, to, to a, another question? We've had a couple of questions that have come in which are essentially about morals. Um, and uh, so, so, so there's, again, there's, there's two parts of this, both by somebody called anonymous attendee. So I, I don't know exactly who that is. Um, so, so one is about the people who are in the film because a lot of the people interviewed in the film, uh, I don't know about you and A, but you know, certainly quite a lot of them have made very wealthy from the platforms that they helped to monetize. Um, not me. They, I, I, I didn't want to guess, you know. Um, were they sort of confessing? You know, was, was this their sort of, you know, existential guilt? Uh, you know, what, what drove them? And then relate to that, do the CEOs of these companies, do they not care about what they're doing? Do they just not know how to fix it? Are they riding a tiger that's out of control? You know, how, how does the whole moral perspective of the senior yeah. people in this field work? Um, great question, and uh, I'm happy to jump into my purely speculative thoughts on this. But um, 
you know, I, I don't think there's any single um, specific consistent theme across all of the various subjects and people that we've spoken to. Um, I, I think in some cases, um, some of them have been actively trying to do this work to make amends for their past, what they might perceive as their past regressions. Some of them are actively donating money to organizations. Some of them are putting in blood, sweat, tears, and time into co countless conversations. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's very, very different for different people. Um, but I think in many ways, uh, the, the biggest thing, honestly, some of them that we spoke to were going through their own development and evolution of thinking while we were making the film. Where people that we interviewed once, when we like reached back out to them towards the end of the process, like they went on, on their own journey of realizations around both their role and their contribution and um, and the the system and the way they see it um, evolved over this course of time. You know, we started in 2017 and we wrapped in 2020, and like there's a there's a meaningful shift that has happened in the reckoning around tech in in that time. Um, I think in regards to the CEOs and to the to the executives at the companies, um, once again, this is pure speculation and hearsay and just my own uh, opinion and, and projection on this. But um, I think there are some people who get it. I think there are other people who are in denial. I think there's, it, you know, it's really hard to think that something that you spent much of your life building and most of your adult professional life building is having harms on the planet and um, so I think there's a very natural instinct to deny and um, uh, not want to believe that. Um, and in some cases, it's just the Kool-Aid that's still running through the veins of the industry. Um, I think it's other cases, there are executives and employees who get the significance here and want to make changes, but they can't really, or they feel like they're stuck because of the stock market and they're stuck because of shareholders. And if we've made these changes, like it would be a bigger disruption. And um, we we codenamed the film internally uh, Frankenstein for a while in that I, I do feel like the analogy is apt around like, okay, we they made this thing. We, the, the community, the, I'm, I'm putting myself in their shoes, but this these types of technologies have now been built and born. And what do you do about it? You can't just like pull the plug. And so there's a really difficult and challenging conversation such that even if one of these companies wanted to change their business model, that's not an easy fix. That's a long, complicated transition. Um, to be able to sustain the organization and to make those changes. Um, the optimist in me is seeing that those conversations are starting to happen, both from um, external pressure coming from the public and from Washington, and then internal employees starting to recognize this is not how we want to be like remembered. This is not what we want our contribution to society being um, at more than one of these companies. Um, speaking of that, I have two questions I'm going to com combine from the audience that are kind of related to the what happens next. So Amelia is asking, um, uh, Amelia Chapman asks, since social media is such a large and diverse online community, do you feel that we need an elected, in quotes, government of the internet or something similar to regulate the community itself, which is interesting? And then Sam Gilbert asks, um, and I think this is both for uh, Jeff and uh, Renee to think about, what recommendations do you have for policymakers, um, given the, the restrictions that you just mentioned, Jeff? I'm happy to jump into this one right now. Um, uh, it's a great question and it's really complicated. Oh, and you just removed the, I was trying to review the questions again. Uh, uh, um, so, okay, recommendations for policymakers. And what was the other part about, um, how, how do we have an elected government of some sort? Okay. Yeah, like an uh, internet government uh, sort of. Like you know, this is where it, it so quickly gets into so many challenging complications, but a couple of frames to offer and to think about. Um, uh, first of all, we, we have regulated other industries. When radio came out, when television came out, everybody was like, oh, these are terrible. And we implemented regulation around what does it mean to broadcast? What does it mean to leverage a technology to reach millions and millions of people? Um, something that I know Renee has said and, and others in our film have said, there's a, there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. And, and I want to separate to some degree, at least in the United States, the First Amendment part of the conversation in free speech versus like what are the responsibilities of the companies that are putting this information out there. Um, another th thought bubble to throw out there is that in the United States, we had, um, we had policy around a thing called the Fairness Doctrine that was removed during the Reagan administration when prior to that, anybody that was putting out content into the world, and this applied to the publishers and to television radio, there needed to be 
fair approach to different sides of a perspective. Um, that was removed in the Reagan administration and in many ways that gave rise to the Rush Limbaugh Fox News and the, the polarization of our news cycle and news system here in the United States, um, where we've sort of ended up in this feedback cycle um, as a result of those. We exist right now in a scenario where the, these platforms have the privileges and benefits of being a publisher without any of the responsibilities of being a publisher. So we've created this gap in the system where as opposed to a, a newspaper, or a news organization that's going to review, apply journalistic standards, fact check, have editors confirm that something is worth publishing before publishing it and trying to really look at where is where are things accurate or not accurate in what we're putting out into the world. That also, I would say, I would extend that to the Netflix's, HBO's, Hulu's as well with the human curation. As opposed to those systems, we now have a system where Anybody can say anything, any, and the, the algorithms will pour, will pour lighter fluid on all of it. And we now live in a world where lies spread six times faster than the truth on Twitter. And, and how, like, what, how do we operate in a society where fake information is just becoming more viral than truth? Right? That, I, I wanna pose it from that perspective around, we have created technologies that have fundamentally eroded our information ecosystem. And what does that look like if we extrapolate that out over time? Right? What does, an understanding of a shared sense of truth. Pick, pick your problem that you care about. You know, for, for me, it's climate change and that that's our past projects for climate. How do we solve climate if people like politicians don't even agree if it's real, right? Not to mention like how we actually get towards solutions. Um, so these are some of the challenges. I think from the policymaker perspective, we need to move both journalism and tech back towards um, guardrails around uh, around how publishing happens. Um, this is one of the speculations in my mind around like, can we reinstate the fairness doctrine? Who, somebody has to be responsible in the, in the system of how content's being released to the world where things are held accountable in some ways. Um, and it either falls on the platforms of the individuals and we, we have to figure out where those go. Um, I think one of the options that some of our partners are starting to talk about is the notion of banning surveillance advertising. So this is a specific slice of the frame where we're not, so Shoshana Zuboff and the surveillance capitalism frame. Um, and then there's like the attention economy frame and there's sort of this middle ground around surveillance, the surveillance um, uh, imperative with the advertising model. That being kind of one of the key points of tension. I did wanna just um, incorporate in, there was another question from I think uh, Jeremy Baumberg around paying attention to advertising, the advertising itself isn't the problem. Like the thing that shows up in the rectangle isn't really the problem. The problem is that the incentives for these companies is that we need to reverse engineer you. We need to learn what makes Tyler tick or Julian or Renee tick such that we keep you on so you can see more and more of the rectangles, right? Volume is the business model. Quantity is the business model and figuring out what gets you to come back is the incentive, that, that is the problem. When you pair the financial incentives of advertising with um, being able to leverage any piece of content in the world to figure out what sticks on you, that's where we're seeing these tensions in the filter bubble and coming from. And I'm going on for a while, but I do wanna throw one more thought out there because this is the, the way I see it now. Um, and this is a, a bit of a different analogy, but I, I, it's one that I, I can't shake and is continuing um, to be top of my mind. Um, as opposed to newspapers or television or a billboard where there's a shared conversation where we can all see the same thing, these platforms give us completely personalized individual content. So we can all use the word Twitter, but my Twitter is different than Renee's versus yours, et cetera. Like we all are getting different things. Um, one of our subjects, Roger McNamee references this as a Truman Show. Um, and if you're too young to have seen the movie, um, you know, in this, in this film, Truman is born into a world where everything is perfectly curated around him. He doesn't even realize that he's living in a completely artificial fabricated world. The analogy that I'd like to introduce here is one of the Galapagos Island and what we know from evolution and how speciation works in nature. So in nature, when you take a species and separate them and allow evolution to happen, those species start to diverge in ways that make them sexually incompatible. Like that literally is how one species turns into two species. And that is how the whole tree of life has been born, right? These platforms, 
if my Twitter is different than each of your Twitters, it is if we are each being put on our own intellectual Galapagos Island, our own isolated um, land of thought. And the machine learning algorithm is evolution by its inherent fundamental function. It is constantly trying to evolve to reverse engineer me and figure me out versus each and every one of you. We are now all ending up on our own islands and our islands are drifting farther and farther apart from each other as the machine learning algorithms figure us out. And yes, like some of us might be drifting together and as like a group drifts together, we're still drifting farther away from other groups that are drifting in the opposite directions. And to, to bring it back to speciation, our ideas are now becoming so divergent that they are intellectually incompatible, right? That just as in with nature, like these ideas, think about somebody that you disagree with politics on, like it is, it's impossible to even find a common ground to start the conversation. That's what we're seeing in our politics. That's what we're seeing certainly here in the United States. And this is the thing that has me most frightened and most worried is that let that experiment run for another decade, right? Continue to drift our ideologies farther and farther from each other over time, we, we're never gonna be able to build consensus in a world that exists around infinite little islands of thought. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a fascinating issue. It's one we've talked about before and will be talking about again. So Ali Goldsworthy, who runs the Depolarization Project at Stanford is also one of our senior research associates. And she and I have worked on, on some of these huge challenges in much the same way. I just partly wanted to bring Renee in on these questions if you can <laughs> remember what they were. Um, well, I think to echo what Jeff was saying, the the echo chamber problem, I think, is a very significant one. And this is one of these areas where in academia, there's a lot of debate about to what extent echo chambers um, shape points of view and how can we track echo chambers. And one of the things I'm sure um, Cambridge folks on this call are, uh, sorry, on this Zoom are familiar with is the dynamic in which um, we don't have very good visibility into anything beyond engagement. And that is a challenge because we can't say from the outside, we can see that particular groups are growing. I'll use QAnon as an example, which is a you know conspiracy theory that really emerged in America, but now has uh, global flavors. Um, I remember when I first started getting pushed QAnon content, it was an account that I had used to study anti-vaccine content. And all of a sudden, because it was you know the anti-vaccine movement has a lot of overlap, uh, with other conspiracy theories, the recommendation engine began pushing QAnon content to this account, and which makes perfect sense. If you believe in one conspiracy, you're likely to believe in another. This is just a correlation, you know, correlation function. It doesn't know what it's recommending or to whom, really. There's no, um, you know, a human would potentially think like, hey, maybe bringing all of the conspiracy theorists in the world under, you know, one umbrella, creating an omni conspiracy might not be societally beneficial. But in terms of how that recommendation engine was structured, it achieved its, you know, its KPIs, right? It, it <laughs> people saw the content and they clicked, right? And you know, and, and that's the kind of the extent of the um, the feedback loop as far as if you're, you know, do people join other groups based on the recommendation prompt? Yes. Then the recommendation engine is doing what it's supposed to do. The problem is, um, you know, what it's supposed to do is not necessarily, um, you know, if, if this was referring gardeners into cooking groups that that is a little bit different than referring all of the conspiracy theorists in the world into uh kind of the creation of this omni conspiracy that then went on to um you know to to do some um some violent acts in the real world as well right so on the outside i could see over time that groups related to these communities had grown from i, I wrote an article about it in 2018 saying hey this is looking a little bit like a cult now and i thought if i if i framed it as are these cults might we treat them differently in the sense that um, perhaps we could agree that pushing people into groups that that demonstrated extremely cult-like behavior was societally negative and that this was you know a way that we could potentially think about some of these extremely conspiratorial group this new breed of of you know kind of digital first cult if you will maybe if we treated them in that way we would react to them differently and at the time i remember it, it was written in um early 2018, I, I said something about um, these groups already have, you know, 10,000 members. <laughs> and then fast forward to when they finally came down, when, when Facebook finally decided that this was a, um, you know, the dangerous organizations team actually became responsible for addressing the proliferation of QAnon on site. And so what we started to see in 2020 was these groups had reached, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and the estimate was that there were many, many, um, 
you know, it was difficult to tell on the outside though. We could see that, you know, when you have three different groups all with 200,000 people in them, what percentage of the 200,000 people are members of all three groups is a thing we can't really tell from the outside. We also couldn't see, uh, were they joining by way of the recommendation engine or was there an interesting cross-platform dynamic where somebody tweets and then people join? And we, we just have so little understanding into the formation of how these echo chambers work. And then when we consider the concept of impact, just because something has high engagement numbers doesn't necessarily mean it's impactful in a uh, in a, you know in an offline harms way. And and so again, um, you don't want to overstate your conclusion, saying hey these groups are growing and these groups are bad. Ergo, you know it, it's very hard to be on the outside and to be looking at these dynamics and to not really have a complete picture, knowing that the only complete picture is the picture uh, internally. And so we do advocate quite a bit for better, you know, more access to researcher data, recognizing that then there are privacy trade-offs with that, you know, and and that has been, I think, one of the more frustrating points in, in debates about polarization, echo chambers, radicalization, inadvertent algorithmic radicalization. Um, we just don't have a ton of visibility. And so you'll see researchers sketch out things using survey data where they can or, you know, um, it, but at the same time, what we then saw on January 6 was a whole lot of people <laughs> with cues on their shirts going and storming the Capitol, you know, and and it wasn't only QAnon, but QAnon was very much there. And this is where we get to this question of, um, are we are we still, you know, because we don't have a, a a concrete understanding of what has happened, I feel like in some ways we're we're having a hard time making that leap to saying that this matters because we don't, you know, as researchers, we don't feel 100% confident or, you know, sufficiently confident in that determination. And yet, um, here are people who are occupying particular niche ecosystems in which they're hearing nonstop from Newsmax and OAN that the election has been stolen, or they're receiving cue drops telling them that the election has been stolen. And then they go and there's a violent insurrection at the Capitol. I think while we may not be able to point directly to the specific piece of content or the specific uh, account or the specific moment at which somebody's view shifted, we do have to recognize that there are these manifestations in the real world now and they tie back to these information environments. And I, I think at this, you know, while we need to be doing a better job getting access to data and studying these information environments, we also can't um, do nothing and just say that this is going to kind of continue apace. We're going to just um, kind of stand by and watch while this while this continues to happen. And that, I think, is the real tension that we face today. Without a concrete thing that we can point to and say, with certainty, this is what is happening, we still have to recognize that these um, that that these developments do continue to happen. That they're having significant real world impact. Uh, and we just have to develop a, a bit of a better handle on on what the information environment is facilitating. We've, thank you. I mean, we've had a very Californian conversation so far. I think we all have, you know, st strong links there. Um, but can I move us sort of southwest quite a way uh, to Australia, where there's been some really interesting developments with with new laws there. Um, uh, one response from Google, a different response from Facebook some criticizing both of them uh, for either complying or not complying. What's your take on that as, a, as an experiment? You know, how did they behave, you know, all three parties? And what does it mean for anywhere else in the world? I don't feel that I am sufficiently informed to comment on the Australia situation, unfortunately. I have a report coming out on um, March 3rd focused on the US and I have honestly done nothing <laughs> <laughs> but write that report <laughs> for the last two weeks. So I don't want to, uh, to overstate. I've only been following it um, as I, you know, as the, uh, um, I, I believe that there's some, uh, there's the challenge with Facebook and then also Google. And this was related to sharing of news and, and a new law that was trying to, uh, to kind of capture some of that revenue, uh, as I understand it. But maybe Jeff can weigh in on this one. Yeah, and, uh, I'm not an expert on this one, but I, for me, I do, I feel like it was a bit of a missed opportunity in some ways in that my personal take is that people should not be getting news from algorithmic feeds. And I saw this as a blessing in disguise if Facebook was removing news from their um, 
algorithm. Uh, and uh, my the selfish hopeless hopefulness there was that like good let this let this perpetuate out. Um, and so the way that it, it's unfolded, um, uh, we so many of we're only going to see more and more um, challenges and tensions between these handful of tech companies and lots of different government um, entities in different ways. Um, and I think for the next few years and for this decade, it's going to be constant legal and, um, and challenges uh, all, all across the planet in different ways. Um, Facebook is, uh, I believe now, the one of the biggest um, lobbying, uh, they, they spend more money on lobbying than almost anybody else. Uh, I think the number for last year is like $19.7 million on lobbying in the United States. Um, they surpassed Google's past record from a couple of years ago. Um, so these companies uh, are both wanting to have the PR spin that they're looking for um, reform and, and, um, and meaningful tech regulation. And then at the same time, they are outspending everybody on trying to shape the regulation in the ways that, we want, that they want. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of interesting standoffs um, between these behemoths and different governments in the years to come. We have another question from Paul Klein at the uh, Anglia Ruskin University. Um, interesting question too about generations, which of course the uh, social dilemma gets into a little bit in terms of the family structure and all of these things. Um, so uh, Paul's question is coming from a generation just before Generation X, um, who know about living before Facebook, uh, how, can our, how can older generations help millennials and Generation Z to get beyond their social media um, ways of life um i i'll just jump in on that one renee if um i we remember what the world was like before social media and i think that is a, a special thing um and it's something that i um in a time of COVID as well when we're so distanced and isolated from each other to remember what meaningful real human connection is about is something to like tap into and cherish. Um, and the more we can um, share that with Gen Z, the, the, all the better. Um, I met with somebody who was a, an executive on the Apple iPhone team, um, and I'll keep the name anonymous for now, but um, uh, their rule at the family dinner table is that there are no phones, no iPhones at the family dinner table. And this is the, one of the people who made it. Um, they have an exception in that if everybody unanimously agrees that they want to pull the phone out to research something and to fact check something over the course of the conversation, it has to be unanimous and then they can pull the, the phone out just to fact check that one thing. Um, I, I think we have um, one of our subjects in this line didn't get into the film, but the line was um, these platforms, uh, they've sold us on an idea of connection, but they're not connection, they are connectivity. When we connect as humans, like I can see your faces, the mirror neurons in the back of my brain are lighting up. I see the muscles in your face reacting to what I say. And we're having a two-way conversation, even though you're not speaking, around what it means to have human connection, right? The ability to have synchronous video and audio is a, is a great technological breakthrough. Um, these platforms in many cases, and certainly the ones that we're, we're criticizing here today, um, they are in so many ways decontextualizing real human connection. Like Twitter is the most decontextualized way you can communicate in my mind. And that's in, in oftentimes from my perspective, why things are so misconstrued or why things um, can unravel in unexpected ways on Twitter because of decontextualizing. So um, what the reminder of like, what is meaningful real human connection versus what these platforms have sold us on? Just one other thought to add there. Um, we learned in this process about the, the thing called the Dunbar number. And the Dunbar number is that we can only really have 150 meaningful relationships in our life. Like the homo sapiens can only hold 150 social relationships in a meaningful way. And so beyond that, like those are acquaintances more than friends. Um, these platforms have, like Facebook has usurped the word friend and given people the false sense that you can have thousands of friends, which is an entire like sociological fallacy in my mind. So what does it mean? Like if, I, you know, on my phone, I've created my Dunbar list. Like who is in the top 150 people that I want to have deep, meaningful connections with? And what does that look like? Um, and so trying to think about like, 
if we can carry that notion to Gen Zers who are growing up in a really, really challenging world and, and certainly middle schoolers who are like entering into their adult development with this imposed layer of performative social comparison being built into their lives. Like I, it is traumatizing. Like I'm, I'm so grateful that I grew up before that, right? Middle school was hard enough before that. And now we have middle schoolers going through their formative um, teenage years with this notion of social, uh, public social pressure constantly following them around. Um, so all the more encouragement in my mind to, to separate um, teenagers um, from these platforms and to have them be extremely intentional with the usage. And thanks to whoever Dunbar number references there. That was me. You're welcome. Oh, th thanks, Snyder. Yeah. Uh, Renee, did you want to add anything to? Add no, anything I think that I think that sums it up pretty well. Okay. Uh, I... Julie, another question. So, so we've we've had lots of questions over. Um, two two slight criticisms of the film, just because we've been you know very positive. Um, so, so, so one is somebody who, who complains it was so dram dramatized and sort of almost manipulating us. In fairness, they, they, they say listening to you talk fact is actually just much more powerful for them. Um, so, you know, whether that's a criticism of, of, of the film or not is, is an interesting question. But there is a flip side where uh, somebody asks uh, Andrew Nye, uh, love the film, but weren't you to some extent guilty of creating your own filter bubble? You know, were, were you tempted to get somebody in who would disagree, who would make the case for some of the things which are happening, or did you over demonize? Um, great questions, and I appreciate them. Um, uh, on the first point, um, this is the difference between us being able to dive in and have an intellectual conversation with about 200 people that are willing and interested and eager to go into this depth and nuance. Um, the film wasn't for this audience as much as it was for the general public. I kept asking myself, how can I get my mom to watch this movie? Um, and so in some ways, my mom was more of a target audience than anybody uh, participating today. Uh, these are challenges as storytellers, um, but I think we were trying to balance out um, the, the narrative elements of the film uh, were intended to make the ideas and the concepts and the metaphors accessible to the general public in a way that um, just having a, an intellectual conversation about it wouldn't. I think this is why the film has been seen as widely as, as it has been. Um, 38 million households watched the film in the first month on Netflix. So um, uh, I can we can talk for hours around the pros and cons of this technique and this approach. Um, this is what we decided and I do stand by around taking these concepts and making them accessible to the general public, um, even if there's some dilution in that process. Um, the other part around a filter bubble, I, I don't think that we are um, creating a filter bubble in the way we were approaching, um, exploring, capturing, and sharing the ideas that we shared in the film. There are, of course, um, counter perspectives, um, many of which are counter perspectives that have been coming by the tech companies for years. Um, I mean, if you just look at the history of the advertising and statements coming from the Facebooks and Googles, et cetera, um, there's a worldview that has existed for a long time that has been so heavily formed by the PR spin from the tech companies. Um, in many ways, I think we were just trying to offer a counter narrative to that uh, coming from the very people who worked at those companies. Um, and uh, we did a lot of background um, research uh, with employees um, that were still there and employees that weren't there um, and, and did our journalistic integrity around assessing what we were wanting to say and include or not. Um, every single sentence in the film was like heavily, I mean, it took us three years to make the movie. So everything was incredibly intentional. Um, but at the same time, I think our goal was to pose some tough challenging questions to the public um, at the same time um, Facebook or other companies had made had issued their own responses to the film, um, uh, the, the power and privilege and opportunity that they have um, through their uh, through their machinery to to put messages out as well. So um, I, I don't think that it is a filter bubble, um, and uh, and we were trying to provide a counterpoint to the narratives that were out in society for a long time. Um, one more question or a couple more questions and then we'll kind of wrap things up here. Um, as a general kind of like reflective thing, I'm curious and we alluded to this a little bit, um, what would the Social Dilemma documentary look like now if we were to do it now in 2021? 
Um, uh, I've learned so much more about algorithmic bias in the tech companies themselves and in the news feeds themselves. Um, uh, there's an author, Sophia Noble, who wrote a book, The Algorithms of Oppression. Um, we were aware of um, racist and discriminatory algorithms when we were making the film, but the exposure that I had to it at the time was around things beyond the social media and advertising business model companies. Um, a lot of the conversation was around um, hiring algorithms or prison sentencing algorithms or things like that, that obviously are really important and affect society in a big way, but they went beyond the surveillance advertising frame. And that's what uh, I was exposed to at the time. So um, if I could do it over again, I would get Sophia on, on camera and, and get her in the film, absolutely. What do you think, Renee? Would you would you say anything or highlight anything different if you were to do the the social dilemma appearance again this year? Well, we Jeff and I had actually talked about a ton of different topics. Um, the question really became, what was the most, you know, kind of timely as the film was actually being released? So we had I had done a bunch of work on uh, the Russia investigation um, with the Senate Intelligence Committee. And, and that was because the topic of election interference was so much, uh, election interference, I should say, by foreign actors um, was so much a focus of where the conversation was about uh, social media responsibility in 2017 to 2019 or so, 2018 at least, through the midterms in a minimum. Um, and then gradually the you know, the, the realization sunk in, I think, for a lot of people that the foreign interference was really just um, a particular type of uh, manipulation by a particular type of bad actor, but that, again, the, the system was broader. There, there were ways in which many different types of actors could manipulate the same system to achieve uh, dubious outcomes. And so really then the question became which of the factors was most timely, most, most relevant, most resonant in the polarization and the conspiracy theories had, of course, by this point become uh, much more of a dominant theme in in those dynamics than uh, than foreign interference. So I think it's a film that, as I said, you know, when we first started chatting, manages to get at both the kind of evergreen individual things and then also raising the societal implications while recognizing that you can use different narratives to tell the story of the societal implications um, as as real world events kind of continue to uh, to take shape. That That, I think, is um, that through line in which the same types of affordances can be used by foreign actors versus domestic actors to shape narratives around an election, I think is such a key thing for people to understand. And we've really tried to, um, you know, in our work at SIO and others, uh, you know, and, and other uh, partner organizations that we've worked with, continue to try to bring that home a little bit to, to make it a little bit clearer. And I think that that's the challenge of, of you know, of telling a story, you're always going to have that um, confined to a particular point in time. Um, we are almost out of time. Um, there's lots of brilliant questions we haven't managed to get onto about the role of selfies in, in sort of human self worth, about advertisers and whether they bear culpability for, for what's happening, about how to regulate. You know, th th there's just a lot there. But I'd like to finish off um, with one final question uh, uh, to each of you. What should we all be doing now? What, what, what are your big tips for the next steps? Renee? I mean, I think for um, one of the things that's really key is uh, we have so much responsibility as individuals today in deciding what other people see. And I don't think we've really reckoned with the responsibility that comes with that. Um, the ways in which what we choose to retweet or share or post uh, is seen by other members in our community who trust us and just kind of make the assumption that we've checked to make sure that it's real or accurate. Um, I think that as we've all become conduits for information, uh, the, the idea of just stopping to kind of think before you share and checking, are you, are you sharing this because it agrees with your personal biases or are you, you, know, are you sharing this because you've actually clicked through and read the headline? The number one area in which this has been really um, impactful, I think, is uh, as we're starting to see the vaccine rollout, media is not always the best at telling a story and media is plagued by the same need for attention. You know, they need to capture attention to get clicks to, um, you know, to, and, and this leads to kind of clickbait headlines for its own economic incentives. I've seen things like um, repeatedly 
uh, stories that will say something like uh, man gets coronavirus vaccine and dies, right? And that's the headline. Um, and then you click in and the headline is undermined by the first sentence in the first paragraph, which says the person had a heart condition and died of a heart attack two days after receiving the COVID vaccine. And doctors don't think that, that, that it's even related. But these headlines go viral because people see them, they don't click in, they don't read this caveat. And so, um, you know, journalistic malpractice and creating a, a crap headline like that intersects with people who want to altruistically help their community. They want to amplify things. They, you know, would want people to be warned if there were vast problems with the vaccine, for example, are sharing this stuff without even clicking through to read it. Oftentimes it's even paywalled. You, you don't even get to read it, right, which is a whole other, you know, <laughs> topic for another hour. Um, and this is the environment we create in which we all participate in in sharing these stories and in creating a, a particular perception and in the era of false misleading information and clickbait headlines i think we we all do have to recognize our own responsibility on that front as well so we have a responsibility to to, to watch what we what we share jeff what, what's your uh I would, I would echo what renee was saying there i mean i've been thinking through campaigns around like viral is bad like we we know that going viral how does that it got perceived as a good thing because the advertising business model incentivized it. That's the only reason why online virality is a thing because it's divorced completely from quality and it's just like, how fast can we make this spread? And al algorithms have amplified that. Um, I'm picturing art where it's like, put a mask over your phone kind of art, like stop the spread. Um, there's a notion of like, don't share just in case. Like what if it's wrong? and stop the spread around misinformation. Um, I, I think we can look at this at the individual level and the societal level. Um, if you don't need to be on these platforms, I'd encourage you to not be on those platforms. It is a place where journalists, um, for better or worse, go to. And, and when there are specific, as in Renee's case, right, there are places where communities have come together around information that is instrumental to the community. Um, that is something, first of all, that I think many of those members of those communities would pay for, which is a, a side note. Um, but depending on how you're using these platforms, do you really need to use them? Are you, are you getting news and information from these platforms? Can you get your news from news sources that you're paying for? So it just sort of throw some of those questions out at the individual level. At the societal level, this is a conversation we need to be having with others. We need to be having with politicians. We need to be thinking about how this can um, uh, change and be reshaped. If people are going down the path of wanting to become technologists or work in tech, I think there's a huge conversation around ethics in tech and how do we move away from these types of extractive business models. Um, but then uh, meaningful reg le legislation, I think, is going to come down the pipe. Like That is the only option, and we need to get down there. Um, and it should not stop at antitrust and, and privacy. Those are just band-aids in my mind um, and uh, hopefully are just signaling that more regulation is to come as opposed to that being the be-all and end-all. Um, and so th there is so much work that needs to happen um, and on this, and we need more and more research. We need more and more insights. We need more access to data to be able to do good research um, uh, as opposed to this all happening externally. Um, you, may, you know, Facebook and Twitter are sitting on the data troves that would be so revealing if, um, if researchers and ac academics had access to them. Um, so I don't know, there's, uh, this is uh, one step of many, many, many steps to come. So, Renee, Jeff, thank you so much for some really, really interesting things. We could have stayed for many, many hours, probably on each of the questions with, with, with more coming up. It's been so interesting, so much food for thought. So thank you very much for joining us. Someday we hope to bring you to Jesus. We can have sort of uh, conversations there. Isla, a pleasure as ever to work with you and, and, and Think Lab. Thank you very much. Uh, that. Thank you to the audience and hopefully see all of you for soon, online or, or real. Um, if you're still using Facebook, follow us, you know, follow, follow us there, be our friends. Uh, Twitter, Eventbrite, the mailing list. There's a huge amount uh, that we have just in the next few weeks. We have an entire week's programme about sleep, uh, whether it's for you or your children. Uh, we have five events for the, for the Cambridge Festival, looking at how to deal with difficult cancers, about how to fix the economy, about you know, so many things there. We have the founder of Masterclass talking about learning through the life, an amazing opportunity. We have the uh, Lisa Jardine lecture. We'll be hearing from the Regis Professor of History, no less, Lyndall Roper, about the role that emotion should play in history. There's a huge amount coming up. We hope to see you there. But thank you very much, Jeff, Renee, for tonight.